sector uh, in a very sort of scalable, flexible way, access it different ways. But what happens when you want to do analytics on it and you want to do those analytics at scale? Okay. Well, that the world uses MapReduce for that. And the reason is because MapReduce is very good at aggregating large data sets. <clears throat> so what we want to do is combine those two. Um, so what I'm going to show you is uh, I'm just going to move to switching my screen over so that we have... Uh, let's see my source code um, and I'm going to show you what we've been doing N now regarding Hadoop uh, I, I guess there's a couple of you that are familiar with with Hadoop are any of you guys familiar with this idea of the shim have you heard about the shim uh, the cluster shim is that something that very, very few people have used it because it's only it's only useful for one specific version of Hadoop that's at least up until now okay yeah. So our shim basically relies on Gluster, and what it does is it sort of serves as an interface between the MapReduce part of Hadoop, which is what we want to keep, and the HDFS part of Hadoop, which is the file system, which we want to sort of be able to use, uh, use Gluster instead of in certain cases. Of course, there's nothing wrong with HDFS. It's a great file system. But if you have all your data in Gluster and you have terabytes or petabytes of data, you can't just move that data around. So what we so what we have is about I don't know about seven or eight Java classes uh, <laughs> that comprise an implementation of the Hadoop file system interface, and uh, it's called the Gluster file system. Uh, this is available on GitHub, so let's, we can go to the URL. Let's see here. No, I don't want to get that one there. Okay, GitHub. All right. Okay. So yeah, this is available on GitHub. It's uh, github.com gluster slash Hadoop slash gluster dash F, uh, yeah. FS. And the way that this works is it's 100%, it's just Java. So you pull this down and you run Maven package and it'll create a jar file for you. And then that jar file you would put in your Hadoop uh, configuration uh, or li uh, libraries so that it's on the class path. So I'm going to show you what that directory structure looks like first. And if you guys have any questions, stop me if I'm going too deep or I haven't explained. If I see any hands, I'll, I'll, I'll prompt you. Okay. Um, so a Hadoop installation basically consists of some daemons that run and you run these daemons and they provide different services one of them services is a job tracker and a job tracker runs a MapReduce job um, it's there's only one sort of job tracker that runs and it coordinates all the slaves okay every slave is a task tracker and the task trackers run on these things called data nodes okay so if you go into Hadoop and you go into the bin directory Okay. Then you see all these shell scripts. And typically, when you run a MapReduce, uh, a Hadoop cluster, you, you say it's as simple as running this command right here. Uh, start all. Okay. And when you run start all, it starts, in, starts your what, name. What are you typing? Um, oh, you can't see it? No. What do you see? I see your GitHub. Uh, Ooh, okay. Wrong, wrong window. There we go. Now you see it? Yeah, but if you can enlarge it. Uh, Bigger? Okay. Yeah. Let's see what right. I can do here. Okay, I got it. Okay. I got it yeah, disappeared. Where'd it go? There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. 
white. I go with a little bit. Can you uh, can you make it uh, can you make the background white? I guess or change the so you yeah. get black text on the white background. Let's see. It might be a uh, new profile. Is this GNOME terminal? J. No, uh, go. Um, is this GNOME terminal? Yeah, go under. Now, don't worry about profiles. Just go under uh, view. Yeah, I can do it under view. Show me my bar. Preferences? Oh, God. I lost my menu bar. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, um, what happens if I just open a new one? Uh, we'll we'll try that. Sure. Maybe if I open a new one, it'll it'll. Ah, uh, there we go. Black on green might. Would you think that'll be better? Yeah. Okay, like that. Yeah, perfect. So this is also a good. It's it's kind of interesting the way we do development. We do it all on VMs. Um. So what what we do is we have our we have our little corporate um, rels, and in our VMs we have KVM set up, and I SSH into these machines. Um, okay, so now I'm. I'm SSH'd into my root node. And I have three nodes. RHS1, VM2, and VM3. And each one of these is running an instance of Red Hat storage. So it has Gluster and, and all that installed on it. So if I go to user, lib, hadoop, ls, OK. Uh, you can see the whole. This is the. Oh, that's a little. Oh. What generate that tree structure for? Oh, I do that with tree. Oh, I don't okay. have tree. Tree's like the best program uh, ever. Uh, okay. okay. Um, all right. Why, why did you shrink it? <laughs> oh, you can't see that at all when I shrink it. Yeah, no. It. <laughs> okay. Making it big again. Yes. Thank you. No problem. Okay, that's better. Better? That's better. Just leave it there. Okay. So if I ls bin, this is where I was before. These are all the daemons. So when you run start, if I run bin slash start all, okay, then you'll see all these services start up, data node, name node, all this stuff, task tracker. And then if I do stop, all then stop all then it stops all the Hadoop services so it SSHs into the other VMs tells them to shut down whatever so the reason I'm showing you this is because with Gluster we do something a little different what we do is we do start map red okay we don't run these other services because we don't need them okay so we just start the MapReduce service, okay, and then I can run my Java process, and I can see on this machine I have a task tracker running, and I have a job tracker running, okay. So those are the two services that that we run, and 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 from there, um, the Gluster data is accessed through the Hadoop shim. Now let me just make the point that we did not write this shim, we've just taken it over. Okay. So we haven't met the developers who wrote the shim. I don't even know if they still work with any of you guys or not, but it would be great someday to Wait, hang on to know. Who? Oh. Yeah, he's he's around. Is he is he here? Uh, okay. I mean he's he's in the building, he's just not in the room. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so whatever. Say thanks to him for giving us all this wonderful work to do. He he. The, this shim really does work. Really, in terms of for a first pass, it's amazing how 
it actually is possible to use Hadoop without HDFS and reliably. I, so as even though there's things we have to change, it's it's, it's impressive that they were able to get it working. Um, so we have changed some things. We've added tests to it. We've fixed a couple of minor bugs. Um, and there's, I guess, four different ways we can go. There's four different things we've been sort of working on. One is fixing some exceptions that happen during MapReduce jobs where you have sort of multiple connections to a file or multiple input streams opened over a file. We found that uh, there was bugs where, for example, a stream would try to be closed twice and that would throw an exception. Uh, so we fixed some minor bugs like that. And some of the other stuff we're looking at is increasing data locality. So if you go into the source code, and I think it's almost easier to do this through the GitHub interface. Can you see the GitHub interface reasonably well? You have to enlarge it. But enlarge it, but yeah. So if... O plus plus. The, Okay. Basically, these are the classes for the shim. And so we have a Gluster file system, we have an input stream, an output stream, and these are wrappers to your extended attributes. Um, and this Gluster brick class, which I've actually never used, I guess it represents a brick. Um, but the main sort of centerpiece that holds all this together is the Gluster file system. And the Gluster file system is an implementation of the Hadoop file system, okay, which is right here. And so there are some interesting tricks in here which we've been looking at, including slave IO. So this is something that, from a Gluster perspective, might be interesting to you guys. In the Hadoop world, data locality is really impossible. It is really important, not impossible. <laughs> Um, and the reason it's important is because, you know, you've got, I don't know, say you got a 100, 200 terabyte data set, and you're doing a distributed grep on it. So the most difficult part about processing that data set is moving all that information around, and I'm sure most of you guys know this. So the nice thing is with Hadoop, you define a function, and that function simply runs locally. And it's the job of the job tracker to try to shard up a data set so that, so that you have data locality in your processes. And so it'll attempt to assign tasks to files such that those files don't need to be moved across the cluster. Now, of course, things happen in a large file system. Nodes go down, and when nodes go down, have to synchronize information with each other. There's all sorts of um, instances where you do have to move data across the cluster. But in general, you want locality and processing. So with Gluster, this is kind of tricky because we use the shim to going through Fuse. And since, since, since it goes directly through Fuse, you run into this issue where you don't necessarily know where you're reading data from when you go through a fuse mount. So this quick.slave.io feature was coded into this and it's a really interesting feature and we're not sure whether we should actually go production with it or not but what it does is it talks directly to the bricks or it attempts to talk directly to the bricks. And nobody's actually tried to run this in production yet or at least to my knowledge nobody has. Um, but it seems like a really powerful feature. And I think something that, I, the reason I thought it would be cool to bring up is that from from your perspective, we were talking earlier, the engineers out here, and we're wondering, what is the cost of breaking the Gluster volume abstraction in order for optimality? Because if you're reading directly from a brick, then you're kind of breaking the Gluster interface. You're going one level lower than what Gluster promises. Um, through the fuse mount. And so obviously it could improve performance in certain cases because you're not going through fuse, but it could be very dangerous if you run into a situation where the data is changing. 
so that's something that we've been playing around with, reading directly from Bricks. And that leads us to the next sort of topic, which is one of the longer-term goals that we've also considered. And, you know, we've thrown a lot of ideas around. But is integration with LibGF API. Because LibGF API may actually be a lot faster than Fuse also. Okay. So these are all optimization. Mostly, a lot, a lot of the conversation is around optimization. But if we could open up a connection directly to LibGF API and not worry about file system semantics when we're streaming records, um, we're assuming that could be a lot, a lot faster. Um, because Fuse, from what I've heard, is natively slow. Um, and, but of course, that's also an argument. I've heard people say that Fuse isn't slow, or Fuse is only slow in certain cases, and Fuse can be fast if you implement it. So, and that, so I've, I've, this conversation has gone in circles. It's just something interesting to think about. So we have that file system implementation. Um, and the sort of, I think, most exciting thing about where all this is headed is we are the big data team. And this is just Hadoop, and this is just MapReduce, and this is really potentially just the beginning of the type of stuff that we could be working on. So I've talked to John um, about going as far as using um, Gluster as a as potentially a a tool for building domain-specific databases because it gives you a way to build file systems in such a flexible manner that there's all sorts of amazing big data problems you could solve using translators and the translator stack. So this is all just the beginning. Um, so with that sort of out of the way, I'll, I'll show you one last thing if you guys would like to see it. I don't know if I'm out of time, which is how I actually develop against the shim and how I actually test against Gluster. And John, what do you think? Are we out of time? or? No, no, keep going because I, I want to see like how you, you know, if you wanted to get started, how would you, you know, yeah. how would you start working on it? Okay. So this is Eclipse, and I'm sure you guys have heard of it. It's a Java IDE. So you go into Eclipse and you can clone this project, okay, from GitHub. And after you've cloned it, okay. Is this the right directory? Yeah, this is the right directory. You run you can run Maven package. Okay. And Maven will run the oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong window. Okay, yeah. Here we go. Wow. <laughs> can you guys see that? <laughs> no. That's, it's blue, huh? That's yeah, that's <laughs> yellow on blue. <laughs> it's really bad. Well, I can make it bigger. <laughs> oh my god! Can, can you get rid of the blue? I I don't I don't know how to get rid of the blue, man. <laughs> right, Open. We'll yeah, don't, yeah. We'll, we'll just deal with it. Don't, don't worry. We'll, we'll just... yeah, this one's blue too. Yeah. I... Oh wait, because I did. <laughs> okay. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll deal with it. All right. Okay. So. So this is right after you download it, you can just run Maven and it automatically... So yeah, Maven, so a lot of what we've done is playing around with m making the build real robust. So we're pretty happy about that part of it. Clear. Okay. So you do, you do git clone, whatever, and then after you run that, you just do Maven package, and that will build the jar for you. But that's the easy part. Now this is where it gets interesting is that once, you, once you've built the jar, how do you put in your IDE, right? So you do the Maven Eclipse task, Eclipse, colon, Eclipse, okay? And what this does is this creates an Eclipse project for you. So then you can actually load this into Eclipse, and you won't have compile errors. All your jars will be on the class path, and you can just... So you run this task right here, okay? And it creates all those Eclipse goodies that we all love. And then you can just do new, um, whatever, Java project. And, and I'm not going to do all of it, but, yeah, you do new Java project. Or actually, you can do Maven project if you have the Maven plugin, but you don't really need to. And then you hit, um, well, actually, you do import. It might be good that I'm actually pretending to do this because Eclipse is so confusing sometimes. 
Yeah, so you do ex ex existing projects in the workplace, and then you do root directory, and then you go to Hadoop cluster FS, and you hit OK. And Eclipse lets you hit OK, otherwise that would be graph, because Maven went ahead and created all those Eclipse files for you. So you once you in, import it, you get something like this, and you can edit it. And now the next thing you're wondering is like, okay, great. So you got all this working. You edit it. Now how do I actually test it? Dot out. I add something in here. And how do I see this in, in a cluster? So what we do is we, we have some scripts that have automated this process. Um, that I can share with you. Um, but the basic idea is once you run Maven package, okay, uh, clear. Once you run Maven package, there's a jar. And Maven puts that under target. Okay, so if you do ls target, you'll see Gluster FS, this jar. So what we want to do is copy that over to the cluster, right? So we have another GitHub repo, which is private. Um, but we can share it with anyone who's interested, I guess. Um, that just has some VM specific settings so that you can simulate running Gluster and Hadoop in a cluster on a single machine um, by by copying this plugin directly into the Hadoop library directory, which I showed you earlier. So you guys might remember when I was playing around in this VM over here, and I and I did this ls. So if I do ls bin, every Hadoop node has a little, um, I'm sorry, if I do ls um, pwd, cd Hadoop, ls, ls lib, right? Every Hadoop um, installation just has a big folder full of jar files, right? It's different than C. Because you know, see, you have all these DLLs and all this stuff. With the, with Java, you just have jar files everywhere, and it figures it all out dynamically at runtime. So all you have to do is there's no DLL installation or or adding stuff to your um, to your you know Bash RC or you don't have to do anything too fancy. All you have to do is SCP this jar file into this library, and we use a trick, which is that we copy the jar file with the prefix a in front of it. So it's just a, a little trick that makes it so that this jar file is read before the production cluster jar file is read. So all the classes are preferentially going to be read from the first jars that are alphabetically seen on the class path. So with, with that said, um, I can say more build this I named this script build branch and copy jar to vms.sh. So it's kind of a stupid name for a script, but uh, I'm a Java developer. We like big names. So we do cp right here. But where this is line. the script located, Jay? Uh, it's, it's, it's not public. It's on a private GitHub repository at the moment because it's kind of specific to our little deployments and stuff. But we can totally share it and make it public whenever if okay. um, be, be a good idea to do that. Um, and it's also specific to people doing stuff who have Gluster VMs. and uh, So, yeah, so we copy this um, here. We do this SCP operation where it copies this jar file to this machine at user lib, Hadoop lib, and it's called A0 Gluster F, whatever. So that so this basically gives you a way to very rapidly um, sort of write code in Eclipse, which is the simplest way to write Java code, and once you write it, build everything in Maven, and then SCP from your uh, Eclipse running desktop, all these jars directly into the various uh, Hadoop uh, directories, library directories in your VMs using SCP, and then once you do that, you can just run your um, you can run your little your you can run your MapReduce jobs in here. So I can say um, 
right now this is what a MapReduce job looks like when you run it. But what did you actually run? Um, I ran something that's called TestDFSIO, which is just a, a MapReduce job that reads and writes a bunch of data to disk. Okay. Um, and as I'm running this job, um, if I have another terminal somewhere in here. Oh, this is the one you guys hate. Yeah, okay, I'll do the black one. Um, as I'm running this job, I can, you know, ls my Gluster mount, and I can see all my Hadoop files being written to it. So this job actually calculate. This is actually calculating pi. So it calculates the value of pi in a distributed um, fashion. So I can do an ls here, and I can see Hadoop has written all these files to my Gluster mount. Now there's one other uh, thing that I should mention, which is that mounting Gluster and rebuilding the bricks is stuff that we've found ourselves having to do every once in a while. Um, and remounting it and destroying and creating our volumes. So it, it would be cool to learn more about when and how and why you might have to clean up Gluster, remove a brick, replicate a brick, that sort of stuff, because we're still not really 100% aware of all that, of, of all the, the sort of idioms um, about how to really sort of the care and feeding of a Gluster deployment. Um, okay. And so that would really help us. Uh, but overall, yeah, we, we have a pretty solid working setup. And the big thing we're focusing now is adding unit tests so that we can add more features, more functionality, and more... Um, sort of optimizations to the code without worrying about breaking the the plugin. And that's where we're at. So okay. I mean so, I, I could stop right there. I, I'd well, love to like if you guys want to ask questions or anything. Any questions for Jay before we move on? Anything? Uh, oh. Yeah. When we say for XGFS with a file system, is it a layer or is it an actual file system that they can create the file system on any uh, disk? Is, is HDFS an actual disk file system? Or is it just a layer which, on which we can uh, run our map reduce jobs? No, I see what you're saying. Uh, it's not a file system in the way that a C programmer would think of a file system, right? It's not, it's not like a, it doesn't actually. You know, it deals at the at a as a much higher level of abstraction. It doesn't actually access devices. Um, it abstracts the concept of a file system, and it just deals with uh, local files and coordinates them in a distributed sort of way. And it has its own distributed sort of layer on top of the file systems that we all are used to dealing with. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Anything else? Yeah. How is the performance between Gluster and HDFS and Gluster What? So somebody uses HDFS and GlusterFS for Hadoop? Yeah. How is the performance? How is the performance when you use a GlusterFS as the, the backing store? How? Performance of using GlusterFS uh, mimicking HDFS. Well, we haven't done too much in terms of benchmarking because we're trying to really make sure that the APIs are stable. Right. And it probably depends on the workload. Um, we know that theoretically there are things that Hadoop does because it's so well optimized for MapReduce that it's going to be likely Gluster is not just going to natively, naturally match the same performance. So for example, the block abstractions in Hadoop make it really easy to guarantee or to come closer to a guarantee that you're going to have truly parallel um, sort of I.O. because you can take a one petabyte file which wouldn't fit on any one individual computer and it'll be blocked up into, you know, I don't know, 250 set, 256 megabyte, you know, blocks from the very beginning. And because you have that, you because you have that and files are stored that way natively in HDFS, it's very easily when you say, okay, I want to process this 
you know, one petabyte file, it's already been distributed into 256 me uh, megabyte blocks across your cluster, and so you're, you, you've already got that taken care of with cluster. It's not clear to me, and you guys might have some feedback on this, but how you would implement a blocking abstraction in cluster, not really, not really very clear at this at the moment. There might be a translator you could write to that effect. Um, yeah. So that's one of the exciting things about dealing with Gluster is that we might be able to actually implement things like that, but at the same time, it's one of the things that's going to be a little bit of a challenge if if we talk about performance. Okay. Jeff asks, how is that different from striping? Um, striping is a RAID thing, and I guess I, I'm not a, I'm not really sure. I mean when you stripe a disk my understanding is that you can't you can't necessarily process it in parallel because I don't know if the records are broken up properly um, in Hadoop and HDFS when you write records into blocks there's a very well-defined way of reading and writing those records to blocks um, when you stripe I believe there's some redundancy but I don't know if when you have a single like disk array, whether it's 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 easy to read the block separately or not. Now, I could be mistaken. Okay. All right. Any other questions before we go to Sharif? Going once, going twice. All right. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. Um, okay, guys. One one, uh, one final question. How easy is it to have like a, a test Hadoop node that is just a single node, or do you have to have like three nodes? We could do all this on a on a single node, and you can run with it's that's called pseudo distributed. So okay. when you have five daemons running on a single node, that's called pseudo distributed. Okay. Um, you can run MapReduce locally without even having a single node, just in a JVM. Yeah. Uh, so okay. it's very easy to set things like that up. We also have a build server, which I didn't. Uh, share the link with you guys to it, but I'll, I'll grab it off. I just recently set it up on EC2. Okay. Um, that's actually pulling this code and building it nightly, and so. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank All you, right, guys. I appreciate you coming. Thanks. Yeah. All right. And you guys can contact me anytime if you have questions. John Mark has all my information. Wait. J-B-Y-A-S at Red Hat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. See you around. Thanks, guys.